And that means understanding what our adversaries do, what their cyber capabilities are, what their capabilities are in, in how they can track us and sense us and understand what we're doing. Um, and then to, uh, to develop countermeasures to that. And some of them are, you know, quite pedestrian and some of them are high tech. And, you know, so years from now, there'll be another movie that, uh, that gets uh, produced that, uh, that looks at this, but that's, it was not easy, you know, during, you know, the 1970s to operate on the streets of Moscow. They were photographing us and recording us and trying, you know, the ways to keep track of what we we're doing, you know, and we figured out then how to continue to, to do our work. And we are figuring it out now as well. I'm David Chris, And I'm Brian Cunningham. And this is the Lawfare Podcast, May 1st, May Day, 2023. David Cohen is Deputy Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, a position he held also during the Obama administration. He's also been Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence in the Department of the Treasury and a partner at the Wilmer Hale Law Firm. We talk with David about his career, including taking the same job twice, the coming debate about the FISA Amendments Act reauthorization, relationships between CIA and other U.S. government elements, particularly in cyber, the new CIA Mission Center for Transnational and Technology, and the strategic competition between the United States and the People's Republic of China. The discussion with David continues our series of discussions with U.S. cyber leaders, including Chris Inglis, Kemba Walden, Jen Easterly, Rob Joyce, Chris Fonzone, and Laura Galante of ODNI. It's the Lawfare Podcast, May 1st, David Cohen, Deputy Director of the CIA. You're the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, a job that you are doing for the second time. But yes. you're trained as a lawyer, not a spy. And so can you just tell our audience how you ended up in this role? I mean, the truth is I did not expect to be the deputy director of the CIA even one time, much less <laughs> twice. But I am uh, quite uh, quite happy uh, to be in this role. Um, and, I mean, as you noted, I, uh, I trained as a lawyer. You know, I always had a, a latent interest in national security, uh, dating back to, you know, my college days. But I had, you know, spent about 20 years uh, in private practice before I got into uh, really into government. Uh, and I went to the Treasury Department uh, in 2009 in the part of the Treasury Department uh, that was created post 9-11 to deal with national security issues, uh, anti-money laundering, and sanctions in particular, but also the, all the policy issues that uh, that that sort of surrounded those uh, those topics. Uh, and I spent six years at Treasury working on uh, on our sanctions programs, in particular our you know, counterterrorist financing. A lot of the sanctions were involving Iran, North Korea, uh, the the first uh, invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine, other issues like that. And, you know, and got some introduction to the Intel community in that capacity. There is a, a small Intel unit at the Treasury Department that does analysis that, uh, that I had the pleasure of overseeing. Uh, and then in the uh, end of 2014, uh, had uh, a phone call sort of out of the blue from Director John Brennan, who asked me if I would be interested in coming over to be the deputy director uh, of CIA. And, uh, you know, I jumped at the chance. It was a, a great opportunity. I came over, spent the last two years of the Obama administration uh, as the deputy director working with uh, with Director Brennan, you know, was a fantastic uh, opportunity to really to sort of immerse myself in what the CIA does and get to really uh, understand some of the extraordinary things that the women and men of CIA do. Uh, and I was having a terrific time doing that, but then there was an election, uh, and I got uh, I got tossed out of my job along with a bunch of other people. Uh, so I uh, went out into the wilderness for four years, back to practicing law. Uh, but then, you know, the opportunity arose to to come back and do this again. And you know, I I so enjoyed those two years that I had uh, with Director Brennan and. and was you know, eager to to link up with Bill Burns, who's uh, who's now the director, uh, and back with the folks at CIA and the uh, and really the extraordinary mission. And so I, uh, you know, I leapt at the chance to come back in, and so I've uh, I've now been back for a little over two years, uh, 
you know, doing it again, trying to get it right this time. Well, David, <laughs> let me let me drill let me drill down on that for a second because we're lawyers who have also served in policy positions, and a lot of our listeners are lawyers who may be thinking about policy positions. And I had a career at the agency, and I served in operations and analysis, and as a lawyer. And as a manager, and I remember uh, one of my bosses one time, Steve Hadley, who was also a lawyer, telling me, listen, you're the lawyer, not the client. Keep it that way. And so I'm curious about how you make that transition back and forth, how you view your lawyers when you're a client and how you view your clients when you're a lawyer. I think that's interesting to our, our, our viewers, our listeners. Yeah, well, I have never been a lawyer in the national security uh, community. Um, ah. So I've never had the that opportunity to advise uh, on national security issues. I've always been uh, on the client side. And look, I'm, I, first of all, I have great lawyers, uh, general counsel uh, of CIA now, and the last time I did this are both extraordinary lawyers. And I, uh, and whenever I veer into thinking that I can uh, analyze a legal issue or provide legal advice, I'm quickly reminded that I should <laughs> stick on the policy side. You know, so I, I think it, it, it doesn't really become a problem. And the other thing I would say, you know, for, for all the lawyers out there who are interested in, in potentially serving as a lawyer in the national security community, what I think is really um, interesting about that role, um, and you should feel free to, <laughs> to agree or disagree with this, is that the, um, there are interesting, hard legal issues, actual legal issues. But then there are, you know, any number of sort of difficult problems to sort through that are sort of within the boundaries of the law. So you're not butting up against the guardrails, but you're trying to figure out what's the best, smartest, most effective thing to do within the confines of what is you know, legally permissible. And, you know, and I look to our lawyers to, you know, to provide advice and counsel as we think through those hard questions as well. And I think that's that is pretty typical for lawyers in the national security community. Well, and so much of your job as a lawyer in that environment involves cases of first impression. You can't go find a, a statute or a right. case or an executive order provision that actually answers the question, which can sometimes be life or death. So that's a, right. a feature and maybe a bug depending on your personality. Yeah, right. I mean, there's there are, you know, there are, you know, precedents, uh, for lack of a better word, in the national security space, whether it's OLC opinions or, right. or you know, memos written by uh, agency general counsel or just, you know, the practice that, that has grown up over the years and how you deal with, uh, you know, with similar problems. Uh, but you're right, there are, there are questions that come along, uh, you know, and frankly, that's part of what makes this job so interesting and yeah. so enjoyable. There are questions that come along every week that, you know, we have not confronted before that aren't, again, they aren't sort of hardcore legal questions that come up, but they are questions about how, you know, how the agency ought to operate that involve, you know, difficult considerations, some that are informed by, uh, by the statutes that created the CIA, but mostly are informed by how we've understood our role uh, and our responsibilities over the years. So, David, how do you assess the culture of legalism and respect for law and the role of lawyers there? I mean, personally, first of all, did you experience, you know, organ rejection uh, <laughs> when you showed up as the deputy the first or maybe the second time? And, and second, more generally, you know, John Rizzo, by way of example, used to say that the ops, you know, ops people would want very much to get the yes. advice of the lawyers and that it was, if anything, they would sometimes, you know, self-inhibit. Is that your perception as well, that that legalism has very, very strongly infused the agency? Or what, what are you seeing in that regard? Yeah. So, look, I came to the agency, you know, after, you know, 20 years of the practice of law and, you know, the six years of treasury, not knowing what to expect about how lawyers are integrated into the agency's uh, activities. When I came into the agency, I saw really quickly how much the the lawyers are involved you know, up and down the organization every step of the way. So there are you know lawyers who are there to advise the director and the deputy director on a daily basis, but out in the mission centers, you know, in the directorates, 
there are lawyers that are you know forward deployed and part of the team and they are i think exactly as as john rizzo uh indicated they are relied upon you know to be part of the the formulation of whether it's the operation the the technical operation that we're doing whatever the issue is that that is being confronted lawyers are part of the uh, a part of the process and you know i think it's a it is a it's a credit frankly to you know many years of of lawyers in the agency and my predecessors in in making sure that that connection between the lawyers and their clients is one that is um i think quite natural now in the agency yeah that's a, that's a real cultural change i i um I was around in the 80s and the 90s, and there was a time when you sort of had to spend a lot of time and effort winning the trust of your client to get them to tell you anything. And that all changed during the 90s. And I think it's pretty dramatically different now, which is to the good, I think. Yeah, it, uh, it, is, it is definitely, if, if that's the way it was, it has changed. You know, I think there's a appreciation you know, broadly across the agency for the role of the lawyers in helping us, you know, sort through these difficult issues, and frankly, you know, keeping us out of trouble. Yeah. So let's um, go over to uh, the nominal subtopic of our podcast, which is cyber. I mean, CIA obviously is known primarily as a human intelligence collection agency focused on that, but it is actually involved in cyber issues pretty heavily. And in fact, you recently added the new mission center for transnational and technology which was on top of the director for digital innovation that had existed and was created during your last tour. So tell us about how CIA plays in the cyberspace. So let me just take a little bit of a step back because I think understanding how, how CIA plays in the cyberspace and what, what we do with respect to cyber makes sense. Uh, if you understand sort of more broadly, how we, uh, how we approach issues of technology. So, I mean, I think, I hope your listeners uh, appreciate it. Technology you know, is core to what the agency does and has done, you know, since its founding. You know, from the from the very get go, we have had a directorate of science and technology that you know is responsible for you know developing you know the gadgets. I mean, the the line that uh, that I've heard is they do everything from mascara to satellites. Right there, <laughs> they uh, you know they have you know over the years. You know, developed. You know, whether it's alias documents or, or uh, you know, various ways to microphones you know, hidden in martini olives, poison tipped <laughs> umbrellas, all kinds of nifty stuff that you yeah, see. ways to hide things <laughs> on the streets of uh, you know of Moscow. You know, there's all rocks. In our, yeah, <laughs> I mean, in our museum, there's a uh, there is a what looks to all the world like a dead rat. But what it is uh, was a, it was a dead drop. It was you know there was a zipper uh, hidden in that what looks like the dead rat that you could hide a document in and you know leave outside for your asset to pick up and the asset could uh, could then put information in it. So you know, also an implied warning against becoming a double agent. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to rats? <laughs> hashtag uh, hashtag rat zipper. <laughs> um, so anyway, so but I mean the point is we have been uh, we have yeah, embraced technology from the founding of the agency now you know seventy six years ago um, and have partnered with the private sector in developing you know cool technology over the years as well. So you know like the you know the A twelve spy plane you know something that uh, you know, the agency developed uh, with private industry. Google Earth, you know, people may not know that was a that was a the product of a uh, essentially a joint venture between the agency and a private company to do 3D mapping and eventually got commercialized. So over a long time, we have helped develop technology and we have adopted technology in in doing our business. Um, you know, our we have collection that's powered by technology, you know, and we have also been called upon uh, you know, to analyze foreign technological developments, often military, but also other sorts of technology. And so that has been, you know, sort of baked into the DNA of the agency, you know, from the beginning. But I think in the last, you know, 10 years, uh, as the, the revolution in technology has accelerated, 
we have also kind of upped our game on technology. So as you mentioned, uh, back in 2015, we created a new directorate um, at the agency. And these are sort of the big building blocks of how the agency does its work. Um, so we have a you know, director of science and technology that has been around for a long time, a director of operations that oversees you know, our, our uh, overseas espionage activities, director of analysis that does the analytic work that director of support that makes it so that the agency can operate both, you know, here and, and overseas. And we created something called the director of digital innovation, um, which was, you know, focused on, as its name suggests, the, the digital domain and, and cyber. Um, and it in part brought together the disparate parts of the agency that was, that were focused on, on uh, on digital issues, on cyber issues, and in part also created the platform for us to do more uh, in those areas. And, the, and within DDI, the, the Director of Digital Innovation, we have uh, something called the Center for Cyber Intelligence, or CCI, that is where our, um, that's sort of the heart of our cyber activity in the agency. And it does, you know, the, the sort of the cyber offense work, essentially, you know, our collection uh, cyber-enabled collection on what folks are are involved in, and it does cyber defense uh, for the agency. Um, you know, we have a, you know, we have cyber networks uh, that need to be defended, and they're responsible for that. And they also uh, work with uh, with others around the agency doing cyber analysis, so analyzing what our adversaries are doing uh, in the cyber domain. And then they they also do what I would call sort of cyber adjacent work in DDI. So uh, our open source center is in the director of digital innovation. So the folks who look at, you know, overseas open source information to try and, uh, you know, as a, as a, a one of the uh, sources of intelligence that, uh, that we rely upon to do our analysis. I guess the last piece I would say in, in DDI is we also uh, have in there the Office of Cybersecurity. So our agency, you know, Chief Information Security Officer, is there, uh, and and the folks who work with him to ensure the security uh, of our systems, uh, like any other, you know, federal agency, we're subject to uh, to those rules and regulations, and and we take really seriously our own personal sort of cyber hygiene and cyber defense. This is a little bit of a one-off, David, and obviously you probably can't answer in great detail, but I've been thinking a lot about how you could possibly, how an intelligence agency could possibly maintain cover of officers serving undercover overseas in the modern world. I mean, even before yeah. GPT chat and the like, uh, that must be a huge challenge for for you right now. It is a challenge that, you know, and the, the way that we, you know, we think about this is, you know, there's a there's now um, you know digital dust that everybody you know, right. sort of leaves behind yeah. uh, in what they do, um, and uh, we need to be mindful of that um, as we uh, operate undercover overseas. What the digital footprint is of our officers, both frankly before they go overseas and and when they're overseas. Sure, and we train to that. You know, this is something that we're we're well aware of, and so we. We manage our our officers' digital footprint, but the other piece of that is, you know, this we live in an era of you know ubiquitous technical surveillance or, or ubiquitous sensing in many places around the world. You know, not just in you know Beijing or Moscow, but there are you know lots and lots of cities around the world that are adopting you know smart city you know approaches where there are cameras everywhere. Um, you know, there are license plate readers, there's, you know, just a, a whole host of ways to identify uh, what people are doing. Um, and that, you know, frankly, makes it harder for us to, to operate in the way that we have traditionally operated, which is, you know, to, um, you know, you've, you've seen these all in the spy movies, you know, we'll wear a disguise, you know, we'll, we'll take a circuitous route to a meeting with an asset, you know, that's, that is you know, under stress in a in a world where, you know, if you have a cell phone in your pocket, you know, you're every you know half meter you're being tracked. You can yeah. run a hell of an SDR, but if they're just tracking you, really, it's not exactly. that useful, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm almost inclined to uh, 
discredit the Nolan brothers with a lack of imagination and person of interest. And that was only 10 years ago. Right. I mean, the march of technology is something else, right? So, um, but look, we are, we have always been confronted with the need to get ahead of the means and mechanisms that our uh, adversaries are using to try and, you know, and track us down. Um, so that's why we had disguises, that's why, why we had alias stocks, that's why we, you know, do SDRs. And, you know, now, you know, what we, what we're doing is we're evolving our trade craft uh, to address the technical challenge that comes from ubiquitous technical surveillance or other ways that, uh, uh, that the digital era makes our work more challenging. And that means understanding what our adversaries do what their cyber capabilities are, what their capabilities are in, in how they can track us and sense us and understand what we're doing. Um, and then to, uh, to develop countermeasures to that. And some of them are, you know, quite pedestrian and some of them are high tech. And, you know, so years from now, there'll be another movie that, uh, <laughs> that gets uh, yeah. produced that, uh, that looks at this, but that's, it was not easy, you know, during, you know, the 1970s to operate on the streets of Moscow, they were photographing us and recording us and trying, you know, the ways to keep track of what we're doing, you know, and we figured out then how to continue to, to do our work. And we are figuring it out now as well. Fair. Well, so moving from the fantastical to the hopefully sublime, uh, our open source intelligence collection tells us that you and <laughs> your spouse were at South by Southwest recently. How was that? <laughs> uh, it was great. It was great. You know, we went to South by Southwest. Yeah, I think it was the, f the first time the agency had, had been there. But we went, uh, you know, basically for two reasons. One uh, is the same reason that I'm doing this podcast, um, which is that I think we have an obligation as a secret intelligence service in a democracy to explain ourselves, to, to, to talk to, you know, the American people about what we do. I thought you were going to say it was because of Brian very cool Lye, people. Charm and good looks. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that kind of hurts a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was the second reason. Was yeah. the second reason. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I think it's a, uh, it's incumbent on the, the, the leaders of the agency to, uh, to, to get out and to and to talk about what we do um, as best we can. There are obviously limits on that, uh, but there are also things that we can that we can talk about and that we should talk about, so that uh, you know, frankly, so the American people understand what their CIA is doing. I think that's just it's it's part of what we should do as public servants. So that's so we went to South by Southwest, and I go and Director Burns and and others in the agency go to you know a whole variety. Of venues to to talk about you know what the what the agency is doing, South by Southwest gets us access to a you know a, a slightly different slice of America. <laughs> than, Are you uh, recruiting cyber talent at South by Southwest? Well, so that so that was the second reason. So okay. look, that, that in fact is the second reason we were there is we are we are all in on. Uh, upping our game on on issues having to do with technology. Uh, South by Southwest is, you know, apart from the really cool musical acts, it is also a place where uh, where there's a lot of uh, of folks who are involved in technology, in in new and emerging technology, you know, and are are folks who we are interested in talking to, both because we want to recruit talent. Um, there are a lot of you know, folks who are there who are looking for a career in technology, and we are, we are making the case that you can come work for the CIA and uh, and scratch that itch. And we're also uh, on the lookout for uh, for companies that we might want to uh, you know, we might want to work with who who have technology that we could use in our in our operations. You know from you know, from exquisite operations to, you know, to running our business processes, right? I mean, we are, we are a big, uh, a big operation. So, uh, so we went but to South by Southwest really for those two reasons. And I, and it was, I had a great time. It was a terrific uh, venue to, I think, to, to talk about what we do and to interact with folks uh, on the floor. Well, also who knows when you might need to uh, break out that Argo trade craft again. <laughs> Got to keep those connections up. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, we are we we are an agency that's got a lot of a lot of irons in the fire at all the time. Uh, so, if you know, you're a young person or a youngish person and you're interested in applying, CIA can be a little yeah. daunting. You know, you guys are scary and so forth. But the mission might be appealing to some. You know, do you have any? I guess advice to a young person, particularly if maybe they've smoked dope or something once or twice, mm-hmm. you know, how and whether they should, uh, you know, seek you out. Yeah. So you should stop before you apply. Um, that's my first piece of advice. Although we are, we, it is not as preclusive as it used to be, but you should stop. But, but in all seriousness, we are making it easier to apply to work at the agency. It used to be, that you had to, you'd go on the website, there was a long application that you needed to fill out. Um, we have moved to a system now where you submit a resume. So kind of like a normal job. Kind of like a normal job. You guys yeah. are doing doing great modernization. Exactly. Um, and, you know, we take a look at the resume and if it looks like someone that we might be interested in, then we reach out and contact you and the, and the process moves forward. Um, so the the sort of the barrier to entry has been lowered. Uh, if you're interested in the agency, you can basically drop a resume. And we're, we're also doing a whole host of other things to make that process of from, you know, application to onboarding faster and frankly, to modernize it. It's more online now uh, than it used to be. And it goes much more quickly. And one of the, one of the problems that we inherited uh, when Director Burns and I came in was a just extraordinarily long period between application to uh, uh, to people coming on board, um, and that that not surprisingly was a real impediment to to our ability to attract the talent that we that we want in the agency. We would lose people as they were waiting and waiting and waiting to to come on board. It still is not, I think, quite as fast as you know some private sector jobs, but we are but we are driving down the 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 timeline to something that is much more reasonable and much more you know commensurate with what you would find in the private sector you know and in doing that i think becoming uh an easier uh employer for folks to uh to find their way into okay great i'm just going to give one free piece of advice for people applying which is for god's sake don't lie in the background investigation whatever you did if it's too much they'll not hire you, but if you lie, they have absolutely no sense of humor whatsoever about that. Uh, and that's where you can get in some very bad consequences. So just tell the truth. <laughs> let me reinforce, let me reinforce that for especially our younger, uh, generation. I myself passed four polygraphs for four different jobs. I told the truth every time. And believe me, if I got through, you can get through. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's just a shell of a man now. <laughs> so. <laughs> No, I'm serious. The, no, the deputy director gave great advice. If you're doing things that might be a problem, stop. But at least in my experience, the fact that in your youth, you may have done some of those things is not automatically disqualifying as long right. as you've cleaned up your act. Yeah. Yeah. And tell the truth. Yeah. yeah. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. So back to cyber, maybe. I mean, you're the deputy director. And I mean, who are you interacting with in other elements of the government, either the White House or ONCD or, or you know, NSA? Who, who are your main counterparts uh, when you engage on cyber in the interagency? Yeah, so the White House for sure. So both ONCD as well as the, you know, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology. And then a lot of interaction as well with NSA and Cybercom in uh you know in a, in a variety of different ways but then you know truthfully the whole uh conglomeration of agencies that have interest in cyber you know in in various ways so you know some with the fbi you know some with uh you know with CISA, of course um but it's that tends to be a little bit more uh sporadic yeah so you know this is an old question and a little bit of a joke but It's interesting your take on it. So, you know, everybody promotes unity of effort. I mean, I think since, well, for a long time in cyber matters, and that's hard because they cross, you know, many silos. Um, Have you assessed that there is pretty good unity of effort across the government right now in in matters cyber? And, and, And how do we make sense of a call for unity of effort with not one, but two 
uh, White House cyber organizing entities? Are we getting twice the unity or half the unity from that? Yeah, I, look, I think what I have seen in the cyber domain in the government, um, and I have, you know, I have this you know, sort of interesting perspective of having done this job for a couple of years, gone away, and now have come back a couple of years later, is that the the various elements and that are involved in our our cyber, uh, you know, in particular on, on the cyber defense side and cyber policy side, you know, there's been a little bit of growth, right, with the creation of the you know, Office of National Cyber uh, Director. But I think more importantly, what I have witnessed is the the various elements that have a piece of the cyber pie have developed their their particular expertise and and have sort of leaned into their authorities um, and have uh, you know built out their part of the of the effort. There are overlapping authorities and overlapping expertise. Um, but there's, I think, been more sort of differentiation in the in the organism, as it were, uh, over the years. And you know, I, so I think that there's, you know, to use the you know what is probably an overused uh, metaphor. What used to be a little bit of the, you know the you know the six year old soccer game with everybody running around kicking the ball. I think we may not quite be in the Premier League, but we <laughs> might be. Uh, you know, we we might be. Uh, you know, capable of getting getting upgraded uh, soon to the <laughs> Premier League. You heard it here first, David Cohen as Ted Lasso. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> there's been there's been rumint, you know, David, uh, at various times about like the NSC process, the interagency process around cyber operations, and obviously Cyber Command got some new authorities a few years back in the Defense Authorization Act. Um, some people say that that the the interagency for approval of cyber operations is sclerotic and choked off. Some people say it's working smooth as silk, and you know it tends to sort of pendulum back and forth. How do you assess that to the extent you can speak publicly about it? Are we tied up in knots, or are we able to do stuff when we need to without getting gummed to death, or both? Yeah, look, I think yeah. we are we are much much better, and yeah, as we have more reps, essentially we get. We get better at this. Um, I think part of the the critique of you know things being tied up in knots, I think, is a little bit unfair. And I say that because the the question about doing and this is not really the agency's role. I mean, this is me sort of witnessing other parts of the of the government, but in doing cyber operations, is that it raises difficult issues. Uh, you know, policy issues and and some legal issues to go back to you know, what we're talking about at the at the outset, and it's in an area that is still new, um, and there's a lot of you know fresh terrain out there that hasn't been uh, you know hasn't been well mapped, and figuring out what is the the right policy approach requires you know some some hard conversations and hard decisions to get made. And so I think being deliberate and smart and thoughtful about uh, using, you know, cyber as a as a as a tool makes good sense. Now, do we over torque it sometimes? Probably, but is it uh, is it better than being a bunch of cyber cowboys? Yeah, I think so. And so, I mean, that's what I witness. I mean, I should hasten to add, like I. Typically, in these sorts of conversations, I am a you know a a fly on the wall observing the conversation about others and others' uh, authorities uh, and capabilities. But that's that's you know sort of from my vantage point how these conversations play out. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, you know, the DoD guys will tell you like you can do a bomb damage assessment in advance. You know where a kinetic weapon is going to hit and what it'll do you drop a cyber weapon, <laughs> it's a little harder to predict what the uh, collateral effects might be. Yeah. So it's just a harder analysis and it's a newer one too, a newer discipline. So that makes sense. So David, let's pivot to another topic, which is uh, section 702 of the FISA Reauthorization Act, which unless it is reauthorized uh, by the Congress will sunset at the end of this calendar year. CIA and Director Burns and others have been pretty vocal in saying how valuable this authority is to you. Tell us 
what, what is the value proposition for CIA and the government generally around FISA, authoriz- uh, FISA Amendments Act? And, may- and maybe just remind some of our non-geeky listeners what 702 is. Are there any such listeners? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Look, I mean, what 702 is, is a you know, statute enacted by the Congress that allows the government to collect intelligence information on foreign persons outside the United States. Um, there's a whole process and procedure that is uh, spelled out in the statute that requires you know, oversight by a, a specialized court uh, that has uh, been established for that purpose. Um, and the executive branch works within the confines of what the court permits uh, pursuant to the statute and with, I think, quite unusual reporting requirements to Congress. So it is a collection uh, capability directed at foreign persons overseas that is overseen by you know, all three branches of the federal government. And, and to answer your question directly, David, I think we at the CIA and I think in the intelligence community more broadly view the collection that we are able to do pursuant to Section 702 as indispensable uh, to the work that we do in our, you know, in our day jobs and providing you know, indications and warnings of threatening activities by adversaries so that we can inform the president and senior policymakers of what's happening in the world, what the threats are, uh, and so that they can do their job of defining uh, what our national security and foreign policy ought to be. It allows us to do our, to do that with precision, with speed, while respecting the rights of Americans. And as I said, subject to the oversight of all three branches of the federal government. You know, and, you know, you asked about the, the value proposition. So uh, let me, let me give you a couple of, uh, of examples. I mean, one, you know, one metric is the, the president every day gets a, the presidential daily brief, the PDB. And it has in it, you know, a number of articles that, uh, describe, you know, sort of the most important national security issues that the community, the intelligence community thinks that the, the president needs to be, uh, aware of. A sizable proportion of the intelligence that goes into the PDB every day comes from 702 collection. So our analysts, analysts across the community that are writing for the PDB rely on 702 collection to write the PDB articles. But in, in terms of, you know, specific examples of the way that 702, uh, has been useful, let me, let me just tick off a couple of, uh, of them for you. You know, I think in the you know in the early days of 702, it was it was largely focused on the counterterrorism mission. Um, it continues to contribute to that, and in fact, 702 collection contributed to the information that the U.S. government had that that allowed us uh, as a government to take the strike against Ayman al Zawahiri, who was the the leader of Al Qaeda, who was you know, living in a safe house in downtown Kabul, you know, last July. 702 collection, you know, contributed to our knowledge that Zawahiri was there. But out, but it's also really important outside of the, the counterterrorism context. So, for instance, 702 has been used to identify foreign ransomware attacks on U.S. critical infrastructure. And, you know, not just one, but multiple attacks uh, have been identified uh, and defended against because of 702 collection. It's been used to identify and protect against other cyber attacks that have been launched or considered um, coming from, from China, from Russia, from Iran, from North Korea. It's been used in efforts to, to prevent U.S. technology being acquired by adversaries for their advanced weapons programs. Uh, and it's been used to identify efforts by foreign actors to make surreptitious investments in, in U.S. Uh, companies, you know, seeking to bypass regulatory scrutiny and, you know, and tame access to, uh, intellectual property. It's been used more recently to uncover atrocities 
committed by Russia in Ukraine, including the murder of non-combatants, the forced relocation of children from Russian-occupied Ukraine to Russia, and the detention of refugees who are trying to flee violence uh, in, in Ukraine. In the spy business, and you know, so sort of close to home, you know, 702 has, has helped us identify when you know, hostile foreign intelligence services are trying to send their operatives into the United States to recruit spies here in the U.S., it also supports our ability to run safe human intelligence operations abroad by allowing us to gain so invaluable insight into, uh, into our human assets. The individuals who have put their lives on the line to work for the United States. 702 helps us protect them from scrutiny from, you know, from those who would want to do them harm. And finally, and I think importantly, 702 has enabled several re recent successes against foreign drug cartels um, by illuminating their networks and the global supply chains that support them, you know, from China all the way uh, to Mexico, and have facilitated partner government actions against those networks, helping to counter the, the fentanyl threat. So, you know, sort of across the board, sort of the whole gamut of national security issues that, uh, that we focus on, 702 plays a really important role. Boy, those are, those are really powerful uh, examples, David. And, and David, Chris follows us more closely than I do. David, you can correct me, but I don't remember anything like that level of specificity being discussed in public the last time the 702 provisions were re-upped. Are you, do you feel able to, without predicting what the Congress is going to do, you know, behind closed doors, in the skiffs on the Hill, sort of prove to the skeptical members of Congress that all these things you just said have happened? Look, what I can tell you is that the, the uh, intelligence community, you know, and, and the White House and the policy community are committed to, uh, to working with Congress uh, to reauthorize 702. And that includes, uh, you know, providing you know, even more detail behind closed doors uh, about the way that 702 is, as I said, indispensable to the work uh, that we do. You know, so I think our our commitment is that we're gonna we're gonna do that work you know, to make the case uh, that 702 you know really is something that that we need to retain. So that was a terrific survey of all the affirmative use cases. Very compelling, David, and. Um... The last one you mentioned about the drugs and fentanyl in particular, which has been a real scourge. I just want to make sure for the nerdy lawfare listeners, you're not trying to say anything radical uh, and new and different about this authority and the way it's been used in terms of sort of broadly reaching general drug crime, but rather something that's interesting and compelling about the use of it within the existing framework. Is that more or less what you're saying? I think that's a very good way to put it. Okay. Let me come at it from, from the other side then. Let's assume against expectation or at least against hope that the Congress were to let this sunset. Have you guys done any contingency planning? I mean, do you assess that there are legitimate substitutes that might fill the gap that would otherwise be created? Or really, is this just something that is in the sense of indispensable, meaning you really couldn't couldn't backfill for it in any meaningful way. Look, I think it would be extraordinarily difficult to backfill. And it would be both difficult and I think less privacy protecting to right. try to backfill. Right? The way that we would have to try to backfill this is to hoover up a huge amount of data if we could, if we could. And using 12 triple three authorities, which are under 12 triple three authorities. Yeah, exactly. Not as strongly regulated. And, you know, and then, you know, try and derive out of that, you know, mass of, of data, the same you know, insights that we can get in a much more precise, uh, targeted fashion with 702 collection. And, and again, I don't, I don't suspect that we would be able to uh, get to the same point where we, we are in terms of the value that we derive from 702. And so 
then just being realistic about the prospects here in the Congress, given the alignment of, you know, two groups of politicians who are questioning this, the sort of traditional left civil liberties crowd and the, the other newer group on the other side of the spectrum. I mean, are you prepared, and I'm not asking you to do a statement of administration position, but are you being realistic about the kinds of limitations or added protections that might come along with a reauthorization? Probably a lot of those, frankly, are not your ticket because they're more in the FBI space for domestic uh, and non-FI crimes. But I mean, have, has the agency thought about some ground it could give if, if that were necessary to get the thing reauthorized? Well, I guess I would say two things. One is I'm not going to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> At least not with me right there. here. <laughs> uh, but more seriously, look, I think we are, I, I see our role at the agency as providing our expert view on the value of 702 and how we use 702. I'm going to leave it to others to do the negotiating with Congress about you know any amendments or changes. To Very wise. When I asked a similar question to Matt Olson, I said something like, are you prepared to cut off the finger to save the hand? And he said, well, as a baseline for our hopes and dreams here, we're trying to avoid amputation of anything. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so your answer is uh, is just as good as Matt's. <laughs> right. Well, we're, we're, so we're not going to ask you about 702 and China, but we can't let you go without asking about China. So... Yeah. In the interest of time, I would condense what could be 20 questions into 1A and 1B. And 1A is, what do you feel is the most important thing our listeners should know about how the agency and the policy community see the China threat to the United States? And two, are they the single greatest threat to the United States right now and for the foreseeable future? Yeah, look, I think we view China in the agency, and I think this reflects the broader policy community, as the most significant geostrategic threat facing the United States over the over the long term. Um, and that is because China presents a challenge in multiple domains. It presents a military challenge, presents an economic challenge, it presents a ideological challenge, it presents a technological challenge. And so I think as we uh, so sort of assess the the various ways in which you know China puts at risk what we care about as the United States, our our place in the world, our way of life, our economic security, um, and our our technological development. China is you know sort of the the number one concern on each of those dimensions, and so within the agency. We have we have created a, a mission center, which is sort of the 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 operational elements within the agency that we've organized that is focused specifically on China. So we have a China mission center that is responsible for organizing what we do in the agency, specifically focused on China, in China itself. So you know, in the you know, over in uh, you know in the Indo Pacific. Um, but also how we address the threat from China around the world, what we're doing in Latin America, what we're doing in, in Africa, what we're doing uh, in Europe with respect to, the, to the, the, the challenge, the competition with China. A lot of what we are focused on is, is uh, around technology. Um, China has, you know, and Xi Jinping in particular, uh, has declared their intention to uh, surpass the United States as the epicenter of technological uh, development in the world um, and to control the key new and emerging technologies that are being developed, whether it's AI or quantum or you know new battery technology sort of across the board. And you know we are we're very focused on making sure that we understand, what it is that the, the Chinese are trying to do and how they're trying to do it, and then present to the policy community our best understanding and analysis of the ways in which that challenges you know, our national security. The other, you know, the other issue that gets a lot of attention uh, for obvious reasons is the military uh, threat that China poses, and in particular, the, the potential 
that that China may move militarily against Taiwan. Um, and so we spend you know, a, a lot of time focused on understanding what both military capability is uh, from China, but uh, but also importantly, intentions and how Xi Jinping is thinking about uh, achieving what he says quite clearly he wants to achieve, which is to bring Taiwan, you know, completely under the control of Beijing uh, before you know his term expires as the leader of China. I think it remains our assessment that he would prefer to do that uh, without uh, engaging in military conflict. But we are, uh, you know, we're obviously quite attentive to to how Xi Jinping uh, is is trying to effectuate that goal. So anyway, that's a very short version of what is a a quite consuming effort in the agency and across the IC. So David, thank you very much for your uh, spending time with us and for your terrifically insightful and candid answers. It's been great having you. We really appreciate it. And your public service. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare. You'll get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. And check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patja Howell, and your audio engineer for this episode was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo. Our music was performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.